Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. My guest today is Jonathan Hunt Glassman. Jonathan is the founder and CEO of Or Health, an addiction recovery platform focused on making science-backed addiction medicine approachable and accessible for the millions of people who struggle with alcohol use disorder. With over 15 years of experience in the healthcare industry, Jonathan has held key leadership positions in strategy, such as at Humana, Optum, and Bain and Company. His motivation for transforming the addiction treatment field and for founding Or Health stems from his own personal battle with alcohol addiction, a journey that ignited his commitment to enhancing the current landscape of addiction treatments. We're excited to have Jonathan with us today to discuss alcohol addiction, recovery, and an effective medication proven to help people drink less called naltrexone. Jonathan, really nice to have you here today. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great to have you here. You know, Jonathan, you allowed us to share in the introduction that your motivation to enter the addiction treatment field and founding Or Health came from your own journey with addiction. Would you be willing to kind of expand upon that and share more about your journey? Absolutely. I struggled yeah. with addiction to alcohol pretty much my entire adult life. What began as binge drinking in high school and college became a pattern of drinking to blackout in my 20s. And then as I saw peers start to put that sort of excessive alcohol use behind them, the opposite was happening for me. I was having multi-day binges, experiencing the physical and mental health symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. And over those 15 years or so, it was no secret to me that I had a drinking problem. So I sought treatment in a lot of the places that first come to mind, Alcoholics Anonymous, primary care, the emergency room and yeah. pretty much always heard the same thing, which was you need to quit and start going to meetings. And I gave that a shot, but it didn't really click for me. What mm -hmm. was much more of a turning point was connecting with an empathetic expert primary care doctor who listened to my goals and suggested tools that might be helpful in meeting them. I want to get into the tools. And I think the medication we're going to be talking about today is one of those tools that can be now available to folks and has been for a while, but you really want to heighten that as a tool that can be a very helpful adjunct to the other things that can be equally as beneficial. We'll get to that tool idea in a second. Tell me what you've learned along the way of why do people drink? Why do people even drink to excess? And what's usually going on that we might kind of maybe normalize here? There are millions of people who misuse alcohol and as many as 30 million who meet the diagnostic criteria for alcohol use disorder. And so there are perhaps as many reasons for why people misuse alcohol, but there are a few common themes. There's a biological component in that some of us are more predisposed to addiction. There's a significant environmental component. Is it in our household and in our families growing up? For me, it was more exposure in the social fabric of high school and college. And you know, often addiction rises up in our lives in conjunction with other problems that we're having. In my case, anxiety, depression, there are different mental health or just stresses that may not be a, a disorder that can be contributing factors for others. And I think because alcohol is so present in our society, and there are of course yeah. millions who can use it without a problem, it can be many people's first stop in terms of a substance that right. responds to or allays some of those stresses and problems. Right. I appreciate you kind of laying out the bio, you know, the biological predisposition that can be there that's legitimate kind of some of the environmental exposure, whether it's in our families, our schools, you know, colleges, et cetera, or, or sports events. It's it's just, I mean, they're sponsored by and surrounded in and kind of immersed in, but also the idea that that life is hard and life presents us with some very challenging things. And when you present it that way with kind of the biological piece, the environmental piece, you know, the life stressors, challenges, ideally it takes away the shame that can be very much a part of an addiction forming, you know, 
most people don't start doing something to say, hey, you know, I want to become addicted. Most people are going through certain things, not necessarily realizing what can be developing, whether it's a tolerance or something getting its talons into us. And before we know it, we're kind of stuck. And then the secrecy comes, the shame comes with it, all the things that kind of go along. And when you put it the way you're putting it, it reduces the shame, I think, in a very helpful way. Yeah, anyone who's feeling shame about their drinking or misuse of another substance should know they're they're not alone. There are a lot of us who felt those seductive initial effects yeah. of alcohol, yeah. Yeah. tamping down stress, making yeah. us feel more comfortable in a social setting, making yeah. us enjoy a positive moment more. And you're not alone in not feeling the negative consequences until later when it's yeah. a bit harder and requires some focused effort to get things going in the right direction. You talked about a turning point for yourself was getting together with this doc that was a really good and compassionate, very attentive listener, it sounds like, able to not just hear what your goals were. This You sounded very motivated, it sounds like, going into that conversation, but then he was able to point towards some tools and I want to get to the medication in just a moment here, but what are the tools did he, was he suggesting maybe in addition to the medication that what you found helpful? He did a few things right. First was listen to the information I was presenting non-judgmentally in his yeah. words, but also in the look on his face, even yeah. though the facts I was sharing about my alcohol use were objectively very distressing. Two is he supported my goal. The scariest moment for me of this interaction was not talking about my alcohol problem. It was saying, I'm not ready or willing to quit. I want to drink a lot less. And I didn't know how that was going to go over. But he, he took that in as a starting point and said, really good. Work with that. Start there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I told him about some of the forms of what we sometimes call psychosocial support that I'd tried, AA, individualized therapy. And so what he was really able to offer was an additional option on the menu, which was safe, effective, FDA-approved medication for the treatment of alcohol problems. Even though I'd been seeing professionals of various sorts for at least 10 years about this problem and worked in healthcare myself, that was a new option. For me and quite mm. quite eye-opening so this drug got to be a part of your recovery process and i know it's kind of a cornerstone piece of your program naltrexone uh, tell us a little bit more about how this medication you found being beneficial to you such that it created really an inspiration for you to make this like i'm saying kind of a cornerstone part of your platform for people to get this medication to help reduce their alcohol consumption as a start yeah, now Trexon was a great fit for me in that my biggest problem was somewhere around that third or fourth drink, I became a runaway train. Mm -hmm. And once I started taking Naltrexone, the first and second drink just became less rewarding. I didn't yeah. feel the same sense of euphoria and that feedback loop of this feels good. I want another. This feels great. I want mm -hmm. a lot more kind of got interrupted. And that's what naltrexone does in general. It cools off the pleasure and reward that we feel from drinking to get a little more chemical about it. It plugs up um, certain opioid receptors in the brain and therefore blocks uh, opioids produced by our body when we drink. And so alcohol may become less exciting, less pleasurable, easier to control consumption, and over time lead to fewer days drinking, fewer drinks when someone does drink, fewer cravings, and less of a dependence on alcohol overall. Yeah, there's there, there's a pairing, isn't there? There's a, there's a coupling. There's a, a reinforcement process that comes chemically, psychologically with drinking. And little do we know that these things are being paired and formed and that and, the, and those connections, that reinforcement has to be interrupted somehow. And the cool part you're talking about here is, you know, Naltrexon, you know, assists in, with reducing those cravings and the desire for it, as well as providing, I think, a really, you know, opportunity to decrease the quantity and the frequency of the alcohol. 
And what, what's a cool piece, and we know that it reduces the dopamine, that, like you're saying, that reward pleasurable chemical in our brain that's really, really pretty cool chemical. But when it's paired with the wrong things, then it becomes, you know, kind of part of that addiction process. And it gets released, like you said, by the brain after drinking. And and so this idea that it gets to reduce the euphoria that can be common with substance use disorder. In other words, drinking becomes less pleasurable. And we begin to kind of unpair this and uncouple this. So I think that's a really helpful piece. You know, you mentioned earlier some of the stats, and I want to bring the medication into the level of, you know, need that can be out there. Give us some stats on usage. I think you said about 30 million people are dealing with a substance use disorder. And how many tend to, to seek treatment? And what's the recovery process like, do you think, with most people and the use of medications in most recovery processes? So you're right, about 30 million people in the United States meet the diagnostic criteria for alcohol use disorder. The biggest problem we face as a field is that yeah. less than 10% of them get treatment of any sort. So AA okay. group, professional counseling or therapy, medication yeah. management with a physician, anything. Yeah. Uh, less than 2% are prescribed one of the three FDA approved medications for the yeah. treatment of alcohol problems, of which... Now, Trexone is one and recommended as the frontline medication by the leading leading experts right. in the field. Uh, so, you know, the good news is a lot of people recover and a lot of people yeah. recover with the tools that they come into contact with. The bad news is we're not doing a good enough job of offering the full menu of yes. evidence options to yeah. each person who's struggling so right. that more people get in the door in the first place. Because yes. if they're only aware of one or two options that don't really resonate with them, they may right. not get treatment at all. Yeah. And also to those who are in treatment, right. because, and I'm sure you, you've seen this, like, this is a really difficult problem to solve. And there's no guarantee yeah. that the first tool, whether medication or otherwise, is going to be a solution for everybody. So we need to have option two, option three, the combination of options on deck. Right for those who get over that first barrier of seeking treatment. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Are you preparing for a licensure exam in psychology, social work, marriage and family therapy, counseling, or behavioral analysis? AATBS is here to help. We have been supporting behavioral and mental health students to prepare for their licensure exams for more than 45 years. Working with over 1 million students to succeed on test day and move on to the next step in their career. With products ranging from comprehensive courses to quiz banks and delivered live online, self-study online, and in print, AATBS has test prep solutions that meet every student's needs and learning styles. Visit us today at aatbs.com. That's aatbs.com. And use promo code BHT15 to save 15% off your next purchase. Yeah, you know, you're you're highlighting so clearly here that, you know, it, we, we know that it can be shown to reduce, you know, days of drinking and heavy drinking and cravings and relapse. And it, it can be effective on its own. It can be great in combination, you know, with other social supports, like you're saying, all the other pieces that together can help buoy one up and out of this addictive process here. And, and, and it's a great, it can be a great first step, like you said it was for you. But given that it's not always on the on the menu of things that can be offered, what is your understanding of that? Why Why is it maybe not as prescribed as it could be, given its effect? There's plenty of blame to go around, but I think there are three main reasons we see such under-prescription of naltrexone. And that's not my opinion. That's what the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism would tell you too, that this is an under-prescribed medication. Yeah. Number one, it's been off patent for since before direct-to-consumer pharma advertising was a thing that existed. So there's no particular pharma company that has an economic incentive to make yeah. naltrexone a household name like yeah. Viagra or Prozac. Sure. Number two, we still don't spend enough time training physicians and other medical professionals on the treatment of addiction, especially given how often it's going to come up in their practices. We're making progress, but a right. long way to go. So a lot of physicians still go back to kind of the old tools of yeah. a pamphlet and a referral to AA, 
which yeah. is just not using all of the tools of modern medicine that are now available. Right. And then the last is there's still some residual stigma around using medication to treat addiction. You still sometimes hear people say, don't replace one drug with another, which mm-hmm. I don't think is a criticism that has a lot of merit relative to something like naltrexone that is not addictive, not habit forming, not subject to abuse. Really good. You're talking right there about it's not going to be addictive. It's not going to be something that someone, you know, replaces one drug with another and and which can be a common fear around prescribing something medication based <laughs> when you're trying to reduce someone's use around something that's a substance, you know, one substance for another. I also like this emphasis that you have of start where someone is at. That's where that doc with you was so helpful of he might have, you know, thought, well, this is the best place to start. So trying to plug you into that versus saying, where are you at? And what is your, I mean, it goes back to the stages of readiness, you know, one's level of readiness to change. And those are very essential stages for those in the profession to understand. You can't start here if someone's here. Start here where they're at. And if you can do that well developmentally, there's going to be an evolution to a larger and larger, you know, healthy, you know, in this case, work towards maintaining a stable sobriety which is what you've accomplished. And many, many do and can. But I love this emphasis around starting and having different entry points. Now, tracks on being an entry point for those where it's applicable for. Talk a little bit about, Jonathan, if you would, how long does someone stay on now, uh, now on, And what's the experience when they're on it? Well, I'm going to get to side effects in just a moment, but give me the experience about when someone is on it and how long someone can be. I know it's both a, a, a pill they can take or an injection. Take us down that path a little bit, would you? Yeah, so you're right that it can be taken in a tablet form, typically daily. There's also an option to get it injected once a month and then not worry about taking the medication for the next 29 days. Chemically, it does the same thing in all of us. It goes and plugs up that mu 4 opioid receptor. In terms of the things we care about, though, drinking less or quitting, there is meaningful variability in response. So there are some folks who will tell you, for me, this medication was nothing short of a miracle. I stopped caring about drinking. And that's terrific. And then there are folks at the other end of the spectrum who say, I'm not getting anything out of this. What's more common is responses in the middle, where people to some extent say, this is taking the edge off. I'm noticing changes. I'm getting more control. But I also need to be employing my own mindful plan to drink less or quit, my own strategy, my own support from people in my family and friends, um, professionals. Uh, That's probably the mainstream, is it is a helpful tool that turns down the volume, but is not a mute button on alcohol, especially when we go back to there being elements of environment and habit that are part of addiction, you know, beyond the, the pure biological elements. Yeah. What is working for someone? Our experts recommend sticking with it for at least a year. And that's to both let the brain and body rewire and also to have some time to build those healthier habits, to address co-occurring mental health conditions or sources of stress. And then from there, it's an individualized decision about how long to stay on the medication, best made in consultation with a healthcare professional. Yeah. It's safe to take indefinitely. And there are some folks who stay on it for years or for the rest of their life. And yeah. the evidence suggests that's fine. There are others who have the goal of getting off the medication. And the rule of thumb there is the more stable and secure one is feeling in their recovery, the more appropriate that is. So if you've yeah. got multiple months of meeting your moderation or sobriety goals, you've used the time to address co occurring mental health conditions. Things are going so much better at home and at work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Reasonable to, to consider stopping. If you feel like you're hanging on every day to your goals, not the best time to take a, a useful tool out of the, the toolkit. I love that reference. It's, 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 it's not necessarily a mute button, maybe for a small handful it can be, but it turns down a volume such that other things can be brought in, maybe even kind of creating a space. And I think when we look at most medications, we look at antidepressants, we look at, you know, anti-anxiety medications, others, typically six months, nine months to a year, typically a year is when we look at a typical prescriptive process that says, by this time, we know that 
those chemicals that have been imbalanced, you know, and keeping all keeping all pistons from firing the way that we know that they can, your body tends to kind of rewire. That's a good word you're using to rewire at that point so that we can begin to consider weaning off of them at that point. And we begin to slowly wean off and see how the response is. And a good number of people say, yeah, I feel like I can come off this because my brain's kind of kickstarted again on its own. It's rewired in healthy ways. I also like the reference you're saying during that year, some really exciting things can happen. People can address other areas of healthy health habits, whether it's, you know, their own medical health, whether it's their own relational health, their own, you know, coping and strategies, maybe they haven't developed in life that are necessary. So developing those healthy habits and maybe even like you said too, addressing some of the underlying stressors that have gone unaddressed. So this can be a really exciting year, can't it? benefited and helped along with the naltrexone, taking that edge off, turning down the volume on these things so they can come into life in a more, I think, effective way. Absolutely. You know, one of the continuing sources of inspiration for, for us at OR is hearing from some of the 25,000 plus, you know, members who've gotten started with naltrexone through us. And the stories are as varied as the people but yeah. quite often they do involve the opening up of the yeah. reopening up of possibility. Um, yeah. In these labs. One of the doctors that we work with likes to say, even as we're saying no to alcohol, yeah. it's really important to be saying yes oh, to yeah. other things that activate healthy, natural reward pathways, exercise, right. time with friends and family that doesn't revolve around alcohol, sex. There are a lot of things that yes. fall into that bucket, but that's often when it really starts to come together for people when there's less alcohol, more of the things in life that really matter. You know, it's interesting because when someone says yes to alcohol, what they're not re recognizing, they're saying no to so many other things that are there. And now when they're saying no to alcohol, now that they have an opportunity to say yes and to come into an experience with all these other things that for some people that didn't even know they were there, or maybe they were just kind of muted in terms of their level of pleasure and, and, and joy that they brought. And now life opens up in a new way, but it that's a process over time. Absolutely. And one I saw, you know, in my own life, only in retrospect, could I yeah. see how much alcohol had kind of narrowed my field of vision. And it's only right. over more than a year, frankly, that I realized I like yoga. I have the time and energy to adopt a dog. So are things that wouldn't have been possible when alcohol was the central thing in my life. Yeah, really good. You know, John, and we love stories kind of that demonstrate or, or share with or illustrate rather some success that the programs have. And I know you've got a great story about this gentleman named Kevin. I would love to hear his story and how or health now, Trek's on your guys' involvement with him, helped him in his journey to recovery. Yeah, I really want to thank Kevin for allowing us to share his story. The way he describes it is that alcohol had become a constant companion in his life in good moments and bad, and ultimately an addiction. Okay. And then one night, stumbling around the internet, as a lot of us do, he came across Or Health and Naltrexone, and it struck him as a ray of hope in a dark time. Mm -hmm. So he signed up through our website, consulted with a clinician, got a prescription. And at first, he didn't know what to expect. But as days and weeks went by, he started to notice some subtle changes and feel more in control of nice. his choices. Nice. And started to realize something big was happening when he found himself at a social gathering with friends that was exactly the sort of setting where he would have overdone it in the past. And he wasn't. And a lot of folks have stories like that of those moments that almost take them by surprise. And so as he looks back, you know, he describes what's built up over time, slowly but surely, as a profound transformation that oh. wasn't without some bumps in the road. As he says, there were moments when old cravings resurfaced and he had to dig deep to, to keep going with his goals. But after this journey with, with Orr and the use of naltrexone, he is now feeling free from the chains of alcohol addiction with newfound hope and optimism for the future. Exactly that sort of 
opening to possibility that you described so eloquently. That's so good, man. What that that's a tangible story, meaning that that that's that's got remnants of everybody's story in some degree, you know, and that makes it accepts uh, kind of accessible and that's a story that can be kind of thought of and say, Hey, I, I could, I could see myself maybe considering something like this. I used to, when I, I kind of grew up professionally in a, in a medical center, I ran a diabetes group for a number of years and talking about stages of change. We were talking about those that were trying to get their diabetes under control. And they were typically given a, a pamphlet and they were told to eat these foods and kind of do these things. And and yet things weren't happening, you know, in terms of change the way that we that, that the people wanted to, and also the professionals dealing with them, they weren't achieving some of the successes. So we decided to put together kind of this group focused on life with diabetes. And we talked about a, a good number of the things that you're talking about, healthy habits, but more the psychological components of it. And one of the things I always asked folks is when they started to take more responsibility for themselves and things like their eating, their stress management, their exercise, all those things that we know directly, like you're saying earlier, can benefit not just benefit one's life, but really help benefit this chronic illness that they were dealing with. I asked them, what was your it that brought you to this group? What is, and I got curious. I mean, there was some some really beautiful stories. Like I wanted to see my daughter get married. So I wanted to live. I don't, another one was, I don't want to lose my limb. And we had some absolutely hilarious ones. It just, I, I don't want to repeat on, on the air, but it's just some so funny ones, but that was their it, you know, as <laughs> this is, this is my time when I need to take responsibility of something. What are some of the it's that you've heard people have, and maybe even weave back in here for us, your it that says, you know what? I'm tired of being tired. What was your it? What are other people's it's that you hear? I'll give you a few that we we hear from our members. One that always touches me is I want to be the parent that my children deserve. <laughs> I get emotional even, even saying it out loud. Absolutely. Uh, others are that I identify with more directly is I'm going to die yeah. if I don't confront this. Yeah. And, you know, that was it for me is before that pivotal conversation with a primary care physician, I had kind of an acute health scare and that wasn't something that was going to kill me in six months or a year, but it opened my eyes to the path that I was on. I wasn't going to be around for my natural life if i didn't stop drinking yeah yeah i've I've heard very th similar things if i don't stop there's going to be something physical that's going to be irreparable and i'm not going to be able to take it back i'm not going to be able to undo it or the, I, I love the piece too and i get choked up when i hear uh, a number of, of the relational ones you know i want to walk my daughter down the aisle yeah, yeah. or like you said i, I want to give my kids a better dad or a better mom or a better experience maybe than I had. I, I want to give them something that I needed somebody to give me that I, that I didn't get. And I don't want to replicate something in kind of this generational legacy, if anything else, I want to give them something different. So, well, I, I appreciate those things. I want to maybe hear a little bit more too, as or health and what you're doing and just some really creative and innovative ways. As you look down the road with regards to addiction treatments, what are you guys planning for in addition to what you're already doing so well right now? Yeah, so the movement that I hope that we're part of at Or Health is that work of making sure each person struggling with alcohol use disorder gets access to the full menu of evidence-based treatment options. Yeah, I like that. We've started by increasing access to safe, effective medication that's recommended as the frontline medication for people with moderate to severe alcohol use disorder. So we're, we feel like we're addressing one of the big gaps in that yep. menu being available. But medication is not the only thing on the menu. Behavioral right. healthcare in the form of coaching, counseling, therapy can be an important tool for many. Mutual peer support, which includes Alcoholics Anonymous, but also things like smart recovery and moderation management can also be extremely helpful. And so when I think about, you know, the future for Or Health, it's not to do everything for everybody. 
who's yeah. struggling with addiction as, as much as we would like to. It's to continually find gaps in what is being offered to folks and fill them in a way that is convenient, private, and accessible, which is what we've done around medication. And now we'll look to some of the other helpful tools. Perhaps. It's really good. I, I love this theme of the full menu. And I also really like your emphasis. And I think that goes out to all the professionals out there and all the people that might be dealing with something like this to recognize that all we need to do is start. You know, we can get a little philosophical here, maybe cliche-ish, but you know, the journey of a thousand miles starts with one with one step, but that's freaking true. That's true. It's just Absolutely. one step. Sometimes those of us in the in the helping business, you know, can let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Of course, we want <laughs> every patient or client to be doing everything that could help them all at once. But if insistence on a particular goal, like sobriety rather than moderation, or on signing up for every aspect of a program becomes a barrier to seeking treatment or staying in treatment, it's just self-defeating. And mm -hmm. so we think there's a lot to be done, getting back to that less than 10% of people getting treatment at all, there's a lot to be done in offering that first approachable step that can open the door to many, many options. Yeah, I, I can't I can't emphasize that enough with you. I think that's such a wonderful point, Jonathan, to, to emphasize. If we don't do that, we set somebody up not to be successful because they're going to get discouraged or they're going to say, you know, that's just not the right fit for me. Maybe I'm not, you know, <laughs> meant to quit or I can't quit or maybe I'm just, you know, too, too far gone. And then disappointment, shame and all those other things come into play when it's not the right fit. So I like this idea of just start somewhere, find something that that works for you because there can be many entries. And I also like the part where you're saying kind of trust the process, just get one step in place. Cause that tended, you know, there's a, there's a natural law. Those things in motion tend to stay in motion. If we can get in the right motion, then we might get that motion to go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, which is what your story is. And now you're, you've got a platform helping those that were once, you know, that are dealing with things that you were once dealing with. And so I, I, I so appreciate that message. Talking about messages, I want to have, as we kind of wind down for today, I'd love you to share with our listeners that might be dealing with something, you know, some of the things that we're talking about today, or they know someone dealing with an alcohol use disorder, leave them with a message of an encouraging word with you about treatment options and the hope that they can have in achieving and maintaining a stable sobriety in their lives. Thanks for that invitation. Three things. Recovery is possible. Yeah. I'm an example of that. There are millions more. Number two, there are many evidence based options mm -hmm. that can make recovery easier. So take the time to familiarize yourself with a few of them. You don't have to become an encyclopedia on every, every option under the sun, but trust your instincts on what might be a good fit for who you are, what your goals are ways that you've solved other difficult problems in the past. And then lastly, it's never too early or too late to get started. Yeah, you good. don't have to wait for rock bottom to stare you in the face. Yeah. But on the other side of that coin, it's never too late to start building a better tomorrow. Really good. Well, talking about maybe building some better tomorrows and never too late to start, Give folks some resources on how they can follow up after our show today to get in contact with you, with Or Health, learn more about Nelchexon. How can they get in contact with you? One good place to start is orhealth.com, O-A-R health.com. Folks can book 15 minutes to chat with me, person to person, kind of like nice. this. It, there's also a lot of information about alcohol use disorder, naltrexone, and medication-assisted treatment and the option to connect with a medical professional to get an evaluation. There are also a lot of great resources out there beyond us. I'll just recommend a few. C3 Foundation um, has tons of information about medication-assisted treatment for alcohol use disorder. The National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration are great resources. Alcoholics Anonymous, Moderation Management, Smart Recovery. Very cool. I appreciate those very much. We're also going to have those up on our site as I'll remind you as we close, but those will be up on our site too, what uh, Jonathan is refer referencing. 
Well, Jonathan, you're a good man, dude. It's great to have you on the show today. And I so appreciate what you're doing and your program is really noteworthy, giving people all the options possible and letting people see that all we need to do is start. And here's one opportunity to start with the support of what your program is doing, the prescription opportunity through your platform. So thank you so much, both for what you're doing and also it's so nice to meet you and have you on the show today. Thank you. Thank you for such an open and authentic conversation. Fantastic. I thank you right back for that. Also want to thank you, our listeners, for joining Jonathan and me today. It's always great to have you with us. Regarding today's episode, I want to remind you that it and an archive of all of our other episodes can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.